to say something before I forgot what it was. No. Well, don't feel so well. Come to faith. I'm glad you made it through the week. Yeah, the week is kind of gone. <clears throat> we have a proposed came out of our Sunday night study and prayer time worship. And this is a pro proposed vision statement. So in the future, we're going to be trying to make this our vision statement. Loving God, <coughs> loving others, and Growing in Christ. Pretty simple. And uh, it's something that we feel that we need to be doing as a church. It's our vision that we are to be loving God, loving others, and we should be growing in Christ as we do so. So this is part of the Sunday night activity <coughs> revitalization process that we've been reading. Now, I will say that you aren't cross-eyed today. <laughs> the church has changed. <laughs> it's reversed on us. And if you didn't notice that, I don't know where you are. <laughs> you saying we're the minority on this side? <laughs> no, I'm saying that, that that side of the church has now became this side oh. with the decorations. Should you we all switch places? <laughs> yeah. Hey, we have said on Sunday nights that sometimes we need to shake things up. Well, right, we just so. did, didn't we? Wanting to pay attention when you come. <laughs> Are you saying we're uneven? <laughs> that was the start of the race. Now we're going towards the finish line. That's right. We just raced all the way around the room. <laughs> By the way, we're within five hundred dollars of our goal, too. Five hundred dollars of our goal. That's great. So, everybody, shake up their pockets a little bit. Let's get that extra five hundred. If it's in your pocket, put it in that one right there. <laughs> change. Change is change. very important. Yeah. Some, some of these folks. Eugene likes a lot of change in here. No, he does not. No? Yes. No. no. Well, how come everybody's putting it in there? Because <laughs> <laughs> we like to change me, doesn't it? He buys it by the pot pool. <laughs> yes. We have a lot of fun with Chris. Everybody does. It's good to enjoy our You're not the one to get the kit. I'm not the one to get the kit. That's why I'm not the one to You want me to bring a box of Kleenex for you next week? That wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. There you go. You got your box. All I know you is <laughs> the rows of the garden are getting less and less. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> this morning the scripture is in Revelation. Chapter 2. Revelation. Chapter 2, verse 1 through 5. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven candle golden lampstand. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles or not and have found them false. You have persevered and endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. 
Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. Now, the Lord was speaking to the seven churches of Asia. And this was the church of Ephesus that he was speaking to here. But, according to Hebrews, God still speaks to us today. And he speaks to us through his holy word. I believe this scripture can be brought to us as though God was speaking directly to us when we feel it touch us through the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 1 says, God who at sundry times in a diverse manner spake in, the, in times past, spake of the fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. I think we've been trying to figure out what is wrong with the church of today. Our church and other churches also seem to be in the same decline. We seem to be suffering the same symptoms. We just went through the study that uh, was called Autopsy of a Deceased Church. Heard a lot of good things. A lot of bad things, I guess. But we learned some important things, I should say. But personally, this morning, I believe that we are suffering from three things. And they're connected. We are suffering from <coughs> the loss of burden. We are suffering from a loss of vision. And we are suffering from a loss of commitment. Not only our church, but many of today's modern day churches are missing these three important things in the church. I want to talk just a little while this morning about the loss of burden. I would like to look into the Bible, God's holy word for a little while and see if it's possible or to see how that we could maybe regain our burden for the lost and the dying world that we are living in, the people that are doomed in sin. And when I say burden, what, what are we referring to in the Bible's piece of burden? Webster defines burden as something that is being carried, like a heavy load. Or maybe it's a duty or a responsibility. I think maybe the duty responsibility is part of the definition that is applicable to the message that I have today, that there is a duty and responsibility which is a burden to us as Christians and as a church. We have been given a duty. We have received a responsibility from the Lord, but the question comes, are we carrying our burden? I was driving down the highway, might have been Friday, no, I think it was Thursday. I was following a pickup, no, it was a one-time truck, and a trailer, and he was loaded with many trash bags full of something. He, he, he had a load. And as he drove, one fell off here, and one fell off over here, and they spun around, 
turned out to be some kind of yard debris. I see one of them pop open. And uh, he was carrying this load down the highway, and he was losing his load. I wondered if he knew he was losing his load. Well, he pulled over up a little ways, and I guess maybe he had figured out that he was losing it. Now, whether he went back to get it, I don't know. And then I was coming down the interstate the next day, and there was a big, wide, white shelving board in the middle of the highway. Someone had lost part of their load. And I thought, how sad. They must have not known they had lost it because they probably paid quite a bit of money. It was one of those nice, big, wide, shelving boards, white. So, it makes you wonder if we understand as Christians and as church, <coughs> we are losing our load as we travel down life's highway. Our burdens are slipping away from us. Our duties, our responsibilities, our obligations. In the text, we see a church, Ephesus, that had lost its burden. The Lord says, Thou hast left thou first love. The word left means to leave, to forsake, or depart. It stresses an act, meaning that someone is personally responsible. Now, I believe that it is a gradual departure. It's not something that just happens instantaneously. They came to a point where putting the service of the Lord ahead of love, devotion, and fellowship with Him. They were all busy trying to serve and labor for the Lord, and they had lost their burden. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life, David said, Proverbs. The labor that they were doing merely became a mechanical spontaneous act. It was the thing that they were responsible to do. So, they were just doing it. But I believe the Lord wants our work, our labor, to be a result of a close, loving walk with Him. He doesn't want it to be a mechanical act of labor. Remember the story of Mary and Martha, how Martha was busy in the house one day doing a lot of work, and uh, Martha was over there, you know, uh, or Mary was over there washing the feet of Jesus. Martha said, hey, you need to get busy. What are you doing over there pondering around and just worshiping the Lord? Kind of that way. I kind of paraphrased it a little bit. But labor is not a substitute for love. But rather, our labor should be a result of our love for God. Remember, Paul says, without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love and patient hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. I believe that Jesus Christ is more concerned 
about what we do with Him than what we do for Him. What we do with Him than what we do for Him. And there's a big difference in that. Too many of these folks in the Ephesian church thought that, and oftentimes we think that it was a very successful church. But the Lord Jesus is pointing out their failure because they had forgotten their first love of the And as I think about the church of today, I think of many that have come to this same point of life. So I wonder, is it possible that we can regain something that we've lost, our burden? I think we need to think about how it used to be. Memory is a great gift that God has given us the ability to remember. The prodigal son, you recall how that it speaks of him in the Bible, had left home with everything. And but I'll start at the point where it says that he came to himself. He began to remember and he began to think, hey, one day he found himself out into his worldliness and, and his lack of concern and, and where he had went to in life. And he come to himself and he thought, hey, I remember how it used to be at home, he thought. He remembered supper time at home and all the other things that he had taken for granted when he was home. And as he compared these things in his memory, he thought, I need to go back home. It was much better there. And that's the way that it really should be. Why am I out here eating husk with the hogs when at my father's house there's plenty? Well, I guess maybe the question that I would like to ask is, do you remember how it used to be? How it was when you were first saved, whenever that you first come to know the Lord, how that the burden of your sin and your guilt was gone and you had a newness in life and you were new in Christ Jesus. Do you remember how it was? Do, does anyone remember how it was? Do you remember the feelings that were inside of your heart? We felt close to God. And he was so real to us that we would have done anything for him. That's the way I felt. The reality of what had happened. But then it seems like that something has happened. That we aren't as close to God as we used to be. That sometimes God feels like he's way off somewhere. Now we can't find time to pray, read our Bibles, or be a witness to others. We aren't burdened for the lost souls. We've lost that feeling that someone is without Christ. Destined to the devil's hell. Say, well, Pastor, I care. We, in our daily lives, we express our loss of burden for souls because we don't seek prayer for them. We don't 
talk about them. We don't witness to them. It seems like that as Christians and as churches that our priorities somehow have gotten rearranged. If we can remember how it used to be, then I think we're maybe a step closer to getting where we should be. If we can remember how it used to be. Repent. It's something that God tells people they should do. Repent is a command from God. It's not a suggestion. But we are commanded to repent. Not an option. Not well, maybe. Repentance is a change of mind that always results in a change of direction. When someone repents, they change their mind, they change their direction, they go a new way. That's repentance. It means that we have to stop. Don't go any further. And turn back to God. The prodigal son, when he came to his senses, he said, Hey, I will. I will, he said. He had a change of thinking. He had changed his mind. He said, Hey, I'll tell you what, I will. He said, I will rise and go. In other words, he repented. He had a change in his thinking. And he was getting ready to change his direction. He was on his way back to the Father. He said, I will say, Father, I have sinned. And it changed his attitude when he came to that realization. He didn't try to uh, somehow rationalize or justify his sin. He just said, I will say, Father, I have sinned. True repentance never makes excuses. If you truly repent, there's no need for an excuse. Jesus said, remember from whence thou art fallen and repent. So, the church today, brothers and sisters, needs to remember from where we have fallen needs to remember from where it has came and repent, change our attitude and change our direction. You know, we have to remember who Jesus was talking to here. This was the church of Ephesus. These were believers. They used to please the Lord with their service, but now he is warning them you need to repent and change your direction. If 
we can think of a time when that we were closer to the Lord than we are right now, then I think we should heed this one. If you can remember being closer to the Lord than you are right now, and God's speaking this morning to us. If we remember how it used to be and we repent, then we are two steps closer to getting back to God. In other words, repeat what we used to do. Do the first works is what Christ is saying. It means that we, we, we need to return to our love and passion and zeal for serving God. And when we were first saved, the way that it was to us. I mean, we have to learn to love the Lord all over again. Start all over. Jesus said, Remember from whence thou art fallen. Repent and do your first works. He's giving us a way to get back to God. I believe this plan will work for us as individuals. It'll work for us as families. It'll work for us as churches. But as always, God gives us the choice. Choose. We don't have to change things. You know, like always, we can ignore what God is warning us about and just keep going the way that we are. But I think before we make that decision, we should consider the cost. such a decision. For us and for future generations. It says that the Lord could remove our candlestick. Well, the church, yeah, the church will be in existence, but it doesn't mean that Fellowship Baptist, or church on the corner will be here. There'll be a church somewhere that God will be working through. But it doesn't mean that it will be our church if we don't heed what God is speaking to us. You know what? I, I thought about this and regaining our first love probably not an easy road. It's a difficult road to travel, but man, when you think about it, wouldn't it really be worth it? Think about the prodigal son as we close here. He had to put aside his personal pride and not allow others to delude him and, and confuse him and what a great blessing he received when he returned to his father. He was walking home with open arms, many blessings. So. 
I believe this morning that God has spoken to our hearts. Maybe showing us what we used to spiritually be. Maybe someone's here today and you're ready for a song needs to come to the altar. But I believe many of us as Christians need to repent of our loss of burden, our first love. I, I recall that coming to the Lord was the greatest moment and how that I had a desire to tell others about what had happened and express to them how that God had forgiven me of my sins. How that whosoever believes in him wouldn't perish but could have ever lasting life. And this morning, maybe he's showing us our personal need. You know, the church tries to, to complicate it today. The modern day church is complicating the gospel. <clears throat> and we look to the many programs and the many things that we're trying to do to figure out what's missing why are we where we are? And I think the message is simple. And the wife stated it pretty much on the way here this morning. I can't remember exactly how she said it. But it kind of struck a chord that, you yeah, know, yeah, I agree and I agree for a long time that it's simple. And as we enter into our vision, we're to love God, love others, and grow in Christ. And we need to believe God trust God and stand on His Word, and most of all, we need to do what He has asked us to do. But, we need to do it out of love for God, not out of obligation. Even though it is our obligation, it's our duty, and we are expected to do it if we don't love God, we will never accomplish what God desires us to do. And that's why Jesus said when they hit him with all of the nonsense of his day, the religious leaders and all of those lawyers and all of those politician type people said, hey, hey, Jesus, wait a minute. Let's see how smart you are, buddy. You tell me what the most important thing is the law and what we're supposed to do. And Jesus said, well, that's simple. You're to love God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, with all of your strength. You're to love God before anything else. And when he saw the perplexed looks, he came and said, and the second is that you love your neighbor like you love your All right. Let's stand.